Welcome to another episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I'm here with Kathy Malchiodi. She is a psychologist, an expressive arts therapist, and an art therapist specializing in trauma recovery. She's also the author of this book, uh, which is Trauma and Expressive Arts Therapy, Brain, Body, and Imagination in the Healing Process. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great to have you here. And uh, trauma recovery has been you know, a huge theme on being human. We've had uh, lots of people working in the field. And I, uh, yeah, as, as far as I can recall, we've never really gone into depth on the role of art and artistic expression mm -hmm. in, in trauma recovery. So I'm yeah, so excited to have you on the show and, and to go into that in a bit more detail. Yeah, and you're not not the only one, and it's I I don't know if we would call it ironic, but it's I think I don't know maybe this is kind of cheeky to say it's the oldest form of psychotherapy because humans have done it for thousands of years in order to recover well before we had formal psychotherapy you know which started 150 or so years ago so you know humans did other things and they were arts based and they were sensory based yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that that yeah, it's it's uh, it's it just it's just we seem to yeah formalized it and and, and treated it as this uh, sort of clinical practice somehow <laughs> divorced from artistic expression. You're right, that's that's how it seems yeah. to have gone. Yeah. So now what's interesting is psychotherapies rediscovering this, but slowly because they've been using talk for all these you know decades, and it's been effective. There are a lot of effective talk therapies, but now there's this rediscovery that maybe we need to address other things that touch other parts of the mind and the body, and I guess you could even say spirit, um, that are not always expressed well with words. Mm. So there's this re re uh, discovery of all of this suddenly. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 exciting uh, that yeah we've got this momentum on on this topic. But for people who are not familiar with, with you and your work, I'd love to, for you to take us back, you know, as far as you want to go into the, the seeds of this interest in, uh, yeah, in, in the expressive arts and then, and then ultimately in, into how it's applied in trauma. Yeah. So release. personally or globally? <laughs> as, yeah. Personally, like, yeah. Yeah. I'm interested yeah. to know, you know, what, what yeah. perhaps what aspects of your childhood shaped you're interested in this. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I think it started in childhood when I experienced the first memorable loss, you know, of a grandparent. And uh, I think my parents were really intuitive about giving me opportunities to express in a lot of different ways. You know, they were reaching for like, what do we do for a child who's grieving? And uh, I got that early background kind of in just being spontaneous and being able to paint and move. And do these kinds of things that we sometimes label as creative, I label them as expressive. And, you know, I think they notice a difference. I notice a difference. So that kind of set me on this path uh, in a way. Maybe it would have happened in a different way, but into the arts. And by the time I became a young adult, that was the major that I wanted to go into, despite everybody saying, what are you going to do with that degree? <laughs> right? Because, you know, it's very hard to make it as an artist in the world. But I really saw two things about it. I saw that, okay, yeah, making art, people look at it, they enjoy it, they view it, they watch it, if it's performance. But also, I knew already that you can gain something personal from it that's very reparative and restorative. And uh, there was no such thing as art therapy and, that I could see at that point. I had no thoughts about that topic. Or what I'm going to talk about, too, is expressive arts therapy. Um, but yeah, I knew, and then I knew as I wanted to look for a graduate program, suddenly I ran into someone who developed a graduate program in art therapy. I didn't care what it was. It just sounded right. <laughs> so that's where I kind of started. And then, so I'm interested. And what was the art, what, what was your artistic expression then in your major? What? Well, a lot of things. Interesting. You know, I went to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which is part of Tufts University. So they were very traditional, you know, uh, doing life studies and learning to paint in the old uh, ways, the traditions, going to the museum and duplicating paintings, all this stuff. 
but they had a lot of professors there who did some really leading edge stuff in performance, in music, you know, uh, all these different kinds of things. So I took all those classes too. And I, I became engaged in performance and music and, and acting and improvisation just right. because it felt good. Mm. And that's where I think the interest came also, you know, with the visual art, but connected to the body and thinking about how, whoa, doing these kinds of performance arts ha has another dimension that's very reparative and restorative and just fun to play, you yeah. know, through your body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's something that, you know, we, we had a, a chat before the show and that was something that we, we touched on was how uh, you don't tend to think of a therapy session as fun, right? It's, it's you know. Yeah. It, well, you're I sat think in a room and you're being asked to you dwell on dark, dark memories. And yeah, we don't tend to relate to it as fun. This is the thing. I think a lot of the more verbal psychotherapists, they love to find out ways that they can do things from being seated in the chair. And that's okay. I mean, that's the way a lot of the training takes place. But what I'm starting to, to in a way, pitch more and more to those audiences. And when you can get them in the same room with you doing these things, they start to realize. Well, your job is kind of fun because psychotherapy is not always fun. I mean, you're mm. listening and dealing with people's really deepest, most hurtful, painful situations. Okay, so, you know, that doesn't go away. But my interaction with people through these methods, it's not the, the patient or the client or the individual, however you want to frame that, gets that benefit. Hopefully, that's what we're working towards. They're the person that, you know, we're, we're focused on. But you end up feeling a little less stress during those sessions, I believe, than if I just did talk alone. <laughs> because yeah. I'm getting to move my body. I'm relating with people through the senses. And I'm getting the benefit of that. And I think that's what psychotherapists start to realize once they start to take these trainings. Wait a minute. Now, I, you know, I'm having this experience. And it almost feels a little bit like self-care. I feel a little bit more energized at the end of the session. Versus just talking alone. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think this is a big secret, <laughs> but it shouldn't be about why therapists, because if a therapist is in a better state of mind and body and spirit and they're going into sessions, then wow, that can only help the person who comes in looking for support. Yeah. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. And when and I compare yeah. it to my own experiences of, therapist and being that I mean it's mm -hmm. been wildly effective all the therapy I've had but yeah the, the the therapist is is trying to play as much as possible as an impassive role right that they're stationary mm -hmm. there yeah yeah and that's actually when I first started graduate school there there was still even though it was an art therapy program there was still an emphasis on being someone who was the quiet person <laughs> the the person in front of you was supposed to be doing all the talking all the doing and you basically kept a straight face you know yeah. pretty much you didn't you didn't share things you didn't show much emotion if possible and i thought this doesn't feel right <laughs> you know I, I, it was there was something about it but you know when you're in training you you try what you're being taught and i was well mentored but i thought that there's got to be something more to this Humans really do heal through attachment to others, connection to others. In order to do that, they have to feel that your presence is there on a lot of different levels. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I'm curious then, why, what prompted you to take the art therapy route rather than continuing as an artist? Oh, I, I, the, I did a lot of studio work and really enjoyed it, but it's very isolating. You're not in contact with a lot of people. You, you, you're in contact with people going to show your work in a gallery. Uh, you know, you might be in contact with other artists, but they're all working on their stuff. And, you know, it takes time to work as an artist uh, in that way. You're focused on selling, <laughs> you know, and promotion and all that. And I just thought, I don't know, I really wanted to be engaged with people. So, you know, like a lot of people that get a visual art degree, I ended up uh, almost immediately in teaching. Now, some people do that because they need the money to support the art <laughs> making, but I, I really enjoyed it too. I thought, like, wow, this is really great. You know, I'm here 
doing these things that I've learned, but I have this connection with these students. And a lot of the first students that I worked with were very young um, children, uh, and then gradually up through uh, the high school age, teenagers, uh, and, and also adults. And I just really enjoy that interaction part because I could see this whole process happening, even in an art class, there were things going on that were very reparative and restorative for people. Mm. Yeah. You can, so that, you, you, to me, that was more rewarding. And, you know, I still constantly make art, but, right. you know, I never, I give it away. I don't think about like, oh, I'm, you know, I've had a few shows over the years, but it's not the main goal for me. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so initially out of college, you, you started as an art teacher rather than an art therapist. Is that right? Yeah, that was kind of what was on the menu, who was what was available. And um, yeah, a lot of, I'd say there's quite a few arts, art graduates that go out into the world that way, because that's one of the ways you, at least you can keep your art alive within that practice, you know, rather than working at, as a barista, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which are some of the other options, restaurant work, hospitality. <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah. But no, I, and I, I hear this from some of my colleagues that I've stayed in touch with over the years who were art students as well. And uh, some of them went on to get back into being an artist, maybe after some years of working or whatever in other jobs. But a lot of them ended up in something similar to me. You know, they, they really did want that interaction with people. And right. to be able to bring that art form, whatever it was, into that situation to support people and help them in their own growth and transformation. Yeah. 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 And so and what was your first opportunity then to practice as an art art therapist? Oh, wow. So so when you come out of school and you have a lot of loan debt, whatever job comes along first, you, you're, you're like, yay, I'm going to get a salary. So I, I stepped into a job I probably wasn't really qualified for, but not a lot of people were qualified for it at the time, period. It was in working with children who had witnessed or been abused. So they either witnessed violence in their home, domestic violence was the terminology used then, or they had been assaulted themselves or neglected. Um, and that was a shelter situation. I was so happy when they offered me the job. And they also said, you know, you're just the right person for this. This is what we really need. And I thought, that, talk about imposter syndrome. I'm thinking like, I think you're right, but I'm thinking, oh, what, what, what do I know? And there wasn't much written then about this. And I have to say, when I started work in that particular setting, the first job, we didn't even talk about trauma. We didn't use that word. You use crisis, you know, all these distress. Um, stress reduction was starting to come online. I know we're starting to talk in that way. The word trauma, I really, you know, didn't really see it really proliferate in the literature until uh, around 1990. So this was in the 80s that I was working in this first job. You know, there in, we didn't, I have to say, dinosaur here, we didn't have the internet <laughs> to look up things. You had to kind of get things in the mail or hear, you know, word of mouth as a conference about domestic violence or, uh, you know, so that was part of it. Part of, the other part was really interesting too. People really thought that children probably shouldn't talk about trauma, that they would just forget about it. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. So those stories that you'd hear, that was kind of the recommendation from some supervisors and some people in the field that children, now oh, they're so young, they'll forget about this. It won't impact the rest of their lives. Oh my goodness. Now we, you know, talk really freely and accept the idea that there's childhood adversity that impacts yeah. us in adulthood. So, yeah. and I have to say the the team that I worked with, which were social workers and childcare workers in this shelter situation, they all didn't buy that. They believed that these children needed intervention right then and there if they right. had you know, faced something horrendous. So, yeah, so I was lucky that way, but we didn't have kind of the literature or research to support that. Right, right. Yeah. So you, you but, but I suppose you were lucky in a sense that everybody within that shelter were all of a mind. Yeah. Because you could see how much these children, not only through, 
you know, and they told very few stories. This was why I think they realized why they needed to hire somebody like me, because they realized there was a lot that wasn't being set, but perhaps these children could work through it through, you know, making drawings, through doing puppet shows, through play activity, you know, through movement, all these different things. So they were right about that. It was just, this was all like a giant learning curve of like, okay, you know, what's really going to work for them. But it did work on that level because many of these children, first we learned, you know, that a lot of them were afraid to talk because they might be further abused. So that made a lot of sense. I just right. thought like, okay, these drawings are away and this, you know, play activity, a way to get those stories out, but like telling without talking. Because no, I hadn't considered there. that angle, right? Because, because of course, that yeah. is the case. Yeah. Like, and there's, I just, I, when I did a look back after probably about the first year and a half that I was working there, I thought, these are really smart survivors, you know, and I need to protect that for them too. I mean, we need to make sure that they're not harmed anymore. But the fact that they know, like, they could put this out in a way without talking about it because protective services might come or they might go back in the home you know, because a lot of them did end up back in the home situation and face more abuse because they had told the stories of their abuse. So that was one thing. But we didn't learn until, gosh, I guess it's been in the last, well, it's been in this century, so to speak, that severe trauma shuts down the language part of the brain. Right. That part of the brain protects us from telling the stories too. And that's some of the work of um, colleague Ruth Lanius, Bessel van der Kolk's talked about that. So those kinds of discoveries explained a lot. And I think some of that started to come on board in the 90s, but mostly in this, this last decade, we're a lot more clear about how that happens. I'm sure that was going on with a lot of those children. You know, children don't always have language, but I'm sure whatever language they did have may have been shut down by the terror. Yeah, right. so... Yeah. So it's really interesting. You know, so my my first theory was always about like, well, you're too afraid to talk. I get it. I get it. I mean, you could be in some really dangerous situation or uncomfortable situation if you tell this with words rather than art or movement or play. But there's a really physical reason, a neuroscience reason why people have to take their time coming back online with the talk. Their brain says, no, it's protecting you. Yeah, no, I think that's fascinating. It is fascinating. <laughs> and, and I've just reminded, there's a, I think there's a table in the book, I'm not going to be able to find it now, but where uh, d depending on the area of the brain you want to engage, you're mm -hmm. going to apply a, you know, a, a different you know, modality or you know, art express yeah. expression. And, and you'll be interested. So that was, well, I guess I started to write that book three years ago because it came out in 2020. So now I'm even farther down the road about we know so much more. It's like I look at that and I think like, okay, that's kind of correct. But now we know more about how it overlaps and these other things that are part of that, you know, why we should introduce a certain maybe movement experience or why we might introduce a drawing, you know, or mark making on paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it moves fast, this field. <laughs> right. And you also <laughs> referenced polyvagal theory in the book. And we've just had yeah. done a few episodes oh, back wow, yeah. about polyvagal theory. And again, that uh, provides us with these clues on mm -hmm. what type of intervention is, is going to work, depending on the level of yeah. shutdown an individual might be experiencing. Yeah. 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 So there's that. And, and of course, now somatic experiencing has become part of the cultural landscape of mental health, I call it. And uh, yeah, a lot of things. There's, there's all new methods coming out all the time. Mm. Yeah. But, you know. And, and so I'm curious, you, you, when you're working in this shelter, what did you, what were you first starting to find would really work with these kids? Like, what, what were your sort of early experiments and, and successes there? Uh, I think the first few couple of years, it was really, <clears throat> they were teaching me what this was all about, okay. uh, you know, and I, th I, what I learned in retrospect, which I was doing correctly, probably by accident, is that my relationship uh, with them was the most important thing. I, uh, mm. and, and that meant 
how do I show them through what I'm doing and what they're sensing about me uh, as safe and trustworthy? It, it took me a while to realize that they were seeing me as a possible hurtful adult because adults had been the people that hurt them. Yeah. And so, you know, you think you walk in the room and you've got art materials and play materials and all this great stuff around, but they're looking at you like, huh, what are you going to do to me? Are you going to hurt me in some way? So the first things I learned were when somebody spilled paint on the table, for example, which children are going to do. And I, you know, and I'm, you know, an art person, so I know this and I'm very, you know, let's get the paper towels, let's clean up the spill. They were expecting violence to break out. I started mm. to learn all these things from not just what they were creating, but their whole way of being in that room that I thought was safe and inviting and all these colorful things for them to engage in. There were very much this hypervigilance. We didn't use that word then, but we kept talking about this in team meetings. I said, they're just always watching me. Like, what am I going to do next? If I, if I move too fast, they're, wait a minute, what's, what's happening? Yeah, so, you know, those, those early moments really impacted me. And, and people still behave that way. It doesn't matter child or adult. We, I see that in my work with people. It, it could, because over the last 15 years, I've worked with combat military. They have reactions. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they can even stop themselves and think, like, I, I'm, I'm having a reaction. This, I don't know why. Uh, but they have those fear responses. So, you know, I think that's the thing about this work. A lot of people think like, okay, when they think about art therapy, they think like, well, and I, I do, I get, <clears throat> I get drawings and things that I think reveal a lot. I have to kind of unpack that with that individual in some way, because I can't make a, an assumption that I know what's going on. But the whole way people go about engaging in these things and engaging with you is, is the other big piece. That's the other half of all of what happens. It's reparative. And that relationship of me giving them these opportunities in safe ways to experience different kinds of novel, action-oriented experiences, I think is a really big piece of the healing, that they're doing it with me. You yeah. Know? Because we see a lot, you know, there was a whole phase in the world there for a while. Everybody had a coloring book. Yeah, Everybody yeah, that's right. There was a sort of mini crisis. We went to the, the grocery store, and there there were coloring books even at the checkout. It was, but I, I got it. I mean, people were uh, at whatever for whatever reason finding out that just this kind of repetitive mark making on the paper, coloring in the, I don't know how people went about it in particular, but were they meticulous about coloring in the shapes? Did they like to complete a design? Whatever. It was rewarding. It was calming. Mm. But that goes just so far. That's self-care. When you really start to repair, it's being with another person doing something on a sensory level. And I think that was the thing I really learned long ago. Because one child really pointed it out to me. I saw her three times over three different years. She came back to that shelter. Terrible abuse in each situation. But then released back out in custody of a, a family member. She finally ended up in a psychiatric hospital a few years after that. And the first person she wanted to get a message to was me. And they didn't know, who's this therapist? But she said, she has a really strange last name. It starts with an M. <laughs> and where, where we lived, there were a lot of people that were named Smith and Johnson. <laughs> so it wasn't too hard for the <laughs> therapist to know, like, ah, oh, that's, you know, Kathy. And, uh, she wrote me a message about how much she remembered from those sessions. But it was all about the fact that she didn't remember exactly what we did. She kept repeating, I remember how much she cared about what I did. She rescued a drawing I was going to throw out. Uh, you know, she really cared one day when I didn't want to talk and she just let me sit next to her and, and, and she read me a story. And I didn't remember some of these things. Some of them I remembered, but not all. But I thought like, wow, that really, and I had no idea it impacted her in that way. So then I realized, yeah, what we do on a sensory level, they may not say it to you in that moment, but they remembered 
And that's what they held on to. And that's the memory she held on to. And she actually checked herself into a psychiatric unit. Because I always said, always look for the, you know, some helping adult. Might be, you know, you might have to go to the hospital. Just go to the hospital. Somebody will help you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, nobody, you know, they never say like, oh, yeah, thank you for that advice. (laughs) It just goes in. You don't know. Like, uh, did that do anything? But. Right. And I think it's that and the doing with them together. You know, yeah. Because she remembered we did things together. So, so just so it's almost mm-hmm. if you'd have been, if you'd have gone for a walk together, but she'd experienced you as a, as a trusting adult. You know, mm-hmm. that would have been yeah. some big major proportion of the healing was just yeah, having experiencing yeah. that relationship. Yeah, and I don't think that would have happened if we were just sitting. You know. Maybe she would have remembered conversation or something that I said, but she had all that kind of sensory thing of what the room was like. She was telling these social workers at that hospital, I remember how Kathy had the room arranged and, you know, all this. And that was back to her childhood because by then she was 15. Right. So, you know, that taught me a lot about what every moment is important, bringing in the senses and, yeah. And making those connections. Yeah, and and this idea, this idea of bringing in the senses senses come comes you know come, comes up a lot through through the course of the book, um, and so yeah, what why is that important, particularly in in trauma you know trauma recovery work? Because I guess in a, in a standard situation, you're using your hearing right to listen to the mm-hmm. to the questions mm-hmm. of the therapist, but but perhaps not a lot else. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think it's because you know, and I think. Uh, Bessel pointed this out well, obviously, in, in, the, in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, the whole idea that it's not just about what's going on up here. I mean, maybe our brain controls everything, but our bodies have a lot of different senses. We have, like you said, hearing, but we have smell, we have taste, we have touch. You know, we have all these different exteroceptive abilities. We also have an internalized ability to feel that's now they call it interoception, but mm. in the old days back in psychology, they call it felt sense. What's your felt sense in your body? Um, and, you know, and a lot of somatic practitioners focus on that. Uh, those things are not easily addressed through talk alone. We have to introduce experiences that help people identify, okay, what I'm feeling in my body. Now, the trick that comes along with that is a lot of people to survive, <clears throat> they have shut off those sensations and they need to be able to turn those back on very sensitively and gently. Uh, and I always see myself in the business of, okay, we're going to get in touch with some of those things, find out what's making you not feel well. I mean, it disturbs you, activates you, or, or creates a shutdown in your body where you just don't want to be engaged with anything. But also the expressive arts take it a little farther because we can help people build capacity for joyful experiences, for mastery, for confidence, for playfulness, for curiosity, all these things, you know, and that doesn't, you can't talk people into that. (laughs) I really don't believe you can. I mean, maybe you can do a pretty good job, but you have to have them experience something in their body that then replaces or fills that gap for where people went numb because they were so anxious and things were so painful and they, they shut it away. And I always say that's a normal response to have normal circumstances. That was yeah. okay to do that. You yeah. know, we all do that. We have to do that to get through, but <clears throat> your body has a right to feel good again. So let's see what we can yeah, find out through just doing some simple things together. You know, what kinds of sensations come up? And, and is that one of the things that distinguishes just inviting people to do art versus expressive arts therapy is you, you're inviting people to connect to their senses as, as they express, as they create? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, th- I think there are a lot of people that introduce like, <clears throat> I find that a lot of counselors, and this is a good thing for actually for counselors to be doing, is to introduce maybe some simple drawing or mark making because we know from study after study that doing something like that, even if it's just like we're just talking, both of us, and you're doodling, you're going to tell me two to three times as much if you're doodling while we're talking than just if we're talking alone. 
We don't know why that is yet. And this study has been uh, repeated several times over the last 20 years with different populations, different groups of people. And there's something about that that stimulates the language. And uh, yeah, there have been some more studies with the military where they've even just done these kinds of very simple things that are art making over four weeks and actually seen on the brain scan at the beginning that, remember that language area of the brain on the left side, kind of, you know, not very active because of the terror or the, you know, uncomfortable about talking about something that's distressful, that kind of starting to light up again. Interesting. Or weeks. Yeah. Just yeah. from doodling and talking. Yeah. 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 Oh. And some of them are doing a little bit of painting. I mean, it's all different kinds of things, but right. is it that hand work making an image of some kind that stimulates that language part of the brain coming back online? So this, so this was really interesting. So here we go. Back thousands of years, humans are doing this, <laughs> probably for the same reason, but nobody had a, a brain scan, fMRI, all this equipment that they could look at what like is actually going on in our heads, like what, what stuff is lighting up you know, when, when they're engaged in something like this. There's yeah. a, re yeah, a reparative element and, yeah. and having people express to another as they do it. So they're in relationship. Yeah as they're expressed. So yeah, so, but most of the studies have been around, you know, measuring the amount of talk and the amount of memory retrieval. And it just increases right. with the mark right. making. Yeah, I always call it just mark making because it could be somebody could be making a picture that they could recognize, but you could just be playing with materials on paper and creating lines and, you know, fun things, doodles. Oh, bless you. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that reduces the, uh, well, that's, that's probably Another question, really. So, so it may be that people um, can express themselves in ways they couldn't if they were just asked to talk uh, through using art. Yeah. But but what if people are like, you know are like ah oh, you know I'm I'm not creative I can't draw mm -hmm. or, you know or, or whatever the the invitation is you know how how do you handle that? It's not that hard. I, I, what, what I'm always looking for in sessions, and I kind of explain this in the beginning to people because, okay, so let's back up here, you know, I, talking about working with military over these last 15 years. A lot of them come in the door saying, I heard that one of my, you know, uh, people that I work with, one of my peers, one of my colleagues, really like this, but I'm a little skeptical. <laughs> I don't know. You know, what are you going to do in here? What are you going to, you know, play, draw? That's kid stuff, you know. And, uh, yeah, so I, I have to do a lot of kind of introducing the whole idea. But what I say, too, is, you know, I always want to do a lot of, try a lot of different things like movement and sound. So they see I've got, you know, drums. They you know, and I say, you know, it could be drawing some people like that. And, you know, you, you probably know a lot of your friends that are in now. There are a lot of military that are in theater groups and doing acting on stage. I mean, talking about their their experiences. So I said, there's a lot of different choices here. And let's just, you know, work with that. Um, so I'm always looking for ways to engage people through simple things that they already do. So here's an example. So one of the things that people do all day long is sigh. We all sigh. <sighs> you know, you don't yeah. even notice it after a while. You know, something happened in the office or you're on your way home and, you know, you're in the car and there's traffic. <sighs> <laughs> you just do these. But it's a relief. It's actually yeah. something that you do to let off that excess energy when you're frustrated, when you're tired, or just you can just do it any time. And it's a, a longer exhale than an inhale. So, you know, a lot of yeah, the I've people... Yeah, I've been in yoga classes and they purposely say, you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and mean, I think even in the polyvagal world, they talk about this too. They talk about it in a lot of places. And there's a lot of good research on it too, you know, and mindfulness that making your exhale longer than your inhale because the exhale is relaxing is really important. So sometimes I just have people, okay, let's do that together. Let's do some different ones. They might have a suggestion. They may have an angry sigh. So we, we do that, uh, you know, it, well, okay. Now do that again. See where that lands in your body. If I can get them to stand up at that point and do it, it's even better. Some people will, some people won't, but you know, really tell me where that is. Okay. 
go back, let's listen to what sound that is, you know, and make that sound again. And I'm doing it with them. Right. You know, I'm not just sitting here like I would yeah. have as a therapist. Yeah, and I, can, I can immediately <laughs> sense the, the fun I'm, coming I'm in. It, you know, and I want to, when they're looking at me, I'm so, did I do it the way, you know, you're doing it? Coach me here. But then I kind of have my piece of white paper in, in colored drawing materials. I say, hey, you know, and I have a d- couple different ways of doing that. It'd be really interesting if you just picked a color right now. What color is it? Okay, you got the color. Do you want more than one color? You can use more than one. You know, it's okay. But any kind of shape or line. Uh, and so people do. They start to make that line. Like they think like, oh, it came out this way. You know, it, came, it was a down or it was, it was an explosion. That's how they get started. I mean, they've all already felt something in their body, a sense of relief. So then if I can get them to go a little farther, I have these body outlines they can choose from and show me where in that body with color shapes and lines did that land. Where did you feel that the most? Mm. You know, was it more up here? Was it in your chest? Did it go all the way down into your body? Yeah. So then they start to think, okay, I can do this. And, you know, and, and somewhere in that space, oftentimes we're having the conversation about two words. One of them is creativity, which a lot of my colleagues use. And I don't, that word's fine, <laughs> but I don't wake up every day creative. <laughs> and I, I went to art school. You know? <laughs> and some days the creative muse is not coming, but we can all be expressive. That's why I like that right. term. Expressive. That's why you use the term. You yeah. can just show me with one line, if that's all you have today, which direction does that line go in as a result of what you just sensed in this moment? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's one way to get them started. And then the other thing I do a lot is bilateral work where I have large pieces of paper and give people two different kinds of, two, two different drawing materials, two different, they can pick whatever color they want and do some bilateral drawing and just give them some prompts just to make marks on that big piece of paper or chalkboard and just to get the body moving and, and liberated and see where that goes. So some people want some prompts like, okay, I'll say, okay, make this movement or let's just go up and down, try to cross the midline. And sometimes, you know, if there's people that that have a playlist on their phone, they have some music they like to listen to, hey, put that on and, you know, do this mark making. Right. So Yeah, so it's amazing once people start to make marks and do things like that and get used to the materials and the colors and get engaged in that they start to develop their own way of expressing you know yeah and some of the some of the pieces of art in the book are extraordinary i mean there's, there's a piece on betrayal which i just incredible yeah and, and another one, the one on depression the, yeah, the, the uh, tear, yeah yeah the survivor <laughs> of you know abuse in the catholic church mm. yeah and and you know those are surprising images because again they stimulate the language and you're thinking the story. And I was at that point thinking, ah, so horrible what that, you know, a member of the clergy did to you. But it was about the fact that his family didn't accept what had happened to him right. and didn't want to hear about it. Yeah. And that was the trauma that he carried, which is true of a lot of trauma. If we're, we're in a traumatic situation it can be less traumatic if there's someone there to support us and accept what happened. It's when yeah. nobody's there and doesn't accept it that the trauma really takes hold, I believe. Yeah, do you have yeah. that witness, the empathic witness or, or not? Mm-hmm. And that makes all the difference, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you, you describe this way of getting people to express. And how do you then deal with with the trauma per se what's your role in 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 dealing with the, the the those events those traumatic events and and sort of yeah the healing that's going to take place as part of this expression i'm i'm interested in yeah how how you work with the trauma itself um you know again i think any therapist would say this is going to be different for different people uh and and that example that i just mentioned is some of the worst 
because there's been an abandonment and betrayal mm. of someone in the moment of when something happened and then people not wanting to believe you. So, you know, in that sense, working with a lot of that is really important. Um, with combat military, there's moral injury. See, there's different topics that come up. Moral injury is the fact that you were asked to go do something to kill people. You know, I mean, that's what you're trained to do. You're trained to defend. But then you come back to civilian life or you come back to the other life. Maybe you're still in the military, but um, you're asked to not be angry anymore and not be all charged up. All those emotions you needed to do the job you needed to do out in combat. <laughs> so there's all kinds of things that happen. Uh, Sexual assault. Sometimes people can admit that, but they can't unpack all those feelings, all the things that are there. So sometimes we're working with that, trying to figure out, you know, how to unpack those very sensitive feelings. Some of them shame, some of them guilt, and some of them anger that people think they shouldn't have. They don't have permission to have. So slowly trying to figure out what those are and, you know, and then exploring that. Where does, you know, for me, again, where does it land in the body? Where is that the most felt? When does that happen? What kind of, because we're also talking in context here. People go out yeah. into the world and they have the context that they have to operate in. So all of that too. Yeah. But I think it keeps, I keep working towards where can we start to expand your capacity? I am big on this idea of capacity through therapy in general, but I think expressive arts therapy really compels me to go in that direction. There's a, there's a model uh, that Dan Siegel developed years ago called Window of Tolerance. And a lot of us have used that model. It's, it's about expanding your tolerance for being, you know, not anxious or worried or angry, or being depressed, being numbed out, being checked out, being almost dissociative. So you're supposed to uh, work from expanding your ability to not be in those states to be uh, more tolerant. I never liked that word tolerant. I thought, no, <laughs> people have tolerated a lot. I, and I think he really meant capacity. So I just started to go with that. But then when I started to think, this is what I want to give people as more as quickly as I can. Now it's not, not often always in the first few sessions, but gradually, the idea that there's some hope here to feel differently. And right. when they have those moments of, huh, wow, look at this drawing I did of the sigh, you know, I really caught that. You know, I want to capitalize on that with them because they're having a moment there of like, huh, oh, I, I really was able to do this. You know, I was able to feel something different. Now, they might walk out and, you know, and they're back to feeling not so great, but they did have that moment that we can capitalize on. So that's kind of what I'm looking for, not to, <laughs> to stop anyone from expressing all that pain that they're going to have. And, and I, I, the movement and the sound and the art making and the mark, mark making enactment all that is so helpful for all that stuff that they could never say with words. So that, you know, that's always there. But then how do we take that and also make that into something that says, huh, I, I'm able, you know, I'm capable. I just always go back to that old idea that um, I think it was Irving Yalom who put out there a long time ago about hope being one of the most important things that mm. people use to recover. And if people don't have that experience. So I think with expressive work, they start to be hopeful, you know, in, in these little small ways of like, right. oh. and I think I'm going to go back to that case that I talked about with the, the girl at 15, you know, wanting to get me a message because she remembered that I believed in her. That, right. You know, yeah. And, and you sowed uh, the seed of hope that that yeah. could happen again. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so that that's kind of my. I don't know if that answered the question, but well, yeah, yeah, no, I'm starting to. I suppose what I'm. I can't help but contrast it to my own experience of, of, of mm -hmm. never having been a therapist, but being a, a therapunt. <laughs> 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 Therapy, I and, guess. <laughs> Therapy, and um, <laughs> and um, 
and, and how the, the the big focus of my work has been on exploring the pain, expressing the pain, getting to the grief associated with that pain and covering that pain. And what's interesting to me is it sounds like you've got a slightly different orientation, whereas, yes, that's part of it. But there's also this focus on, yeah, as you say, building capacity, um, finding an ability to to experience joy and, and building on that. So it's it's a less of sort of mm-hmm. emptying the pain bucket and, and more, mm-hmm. you know, building around positive experiences. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but. I, th- I think the other thing that came into my mind just now is, you know, again, this work is about going through a continuum of things. So usually it's movement and sound I'm trying to start with that right. can go into enactment or playfulness. At some point, I want to get them to image making. And again, I explain that. I say, mark making, you know, look at all, you know, I have all these different kinds of uh, mark making tools. Some of them, you know, brightly colored, some of them more control like colored pencils, some of them paint sticks you can use in big, broad ways. But then I want to get them to narrative. Now, uh, most people are pretty interested in writing about that image uh, and about their lived experiences. And we know that writing and journaling, if just even done on your own, actually is pretty powerful in, in recovery. It's also been uh, proven over a lot of studies, it's powerful for the immune system. Now, we don't know why that works, but but there's some kind of release with that. So I want to get them to, from this lower place of just movement and sound and these kinds of things, to the storytelling. And I think that's where the power of this is. So I have a different kind of thought pattern about this, so to speak, than a talk therapist, because I'm thinking, let's start if they're comfortable with that kind of almost like the lower brain, like doing the movement and, you know, it's not exactly the lower brain because we need all of our brain to move, (laughs) but it's considered, you know, a more simplistic area uh, of the senses. And then gradually getting to that higher brain, using all these things to create the story of the lived experience. And, And, you know, in that case, I'm the witness, but if we're working in a group too, that's even more powerful. People are witnessed by others. That's that's very powerful with a lot of yeah. groups like the military. And I'm working with teachers right now over the last couple of years who are very stressed in the U.S. and found that that is the connection with each other, going through all these different things and then sharing the story to you know to the others to be witnessed by them is boy that's a restorative factor. Yeah, it's a platform for that before. Yeah, you just only do your job and suffer, you know, and and you know. Fascinating so, you say that because the the work that I do in a coaching capacity with with <laughs> teams within businesses, um, very often what people report and there's a storytelling yeah. element of the work we do, and mm-hmm. it's very common for the groups we work with to say that that storytelling aspect and that that again is done in groups was the most powerful yeah. part. Part of the so yeah, and the in, in the typical, you know, one-on-one therapy, you're kind of the community with that person. But if they can get into a larger community, that's really where something starts to happen. I mean, we know that over and over again. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, the teachers that I work with, they're not all traumatized. Some of them are. Some of them do have real trauma. Most of them have stress. A lot of them have what I call distress because it's at a higher level, it's disruptive, and some of them have traumatic stress. But when you go into some of the communities like the military, like people who survive violence or assault, got a lot of people, you know, in uh, surviving right now war, right? Yeah. Uh, The community piece is the most important piece because sometimes you're shut off from how to express your emotions, but you see how somebody else's expressing them and that activates some awareness in the self we need other people to kind of bounce off of and share yeah. and then be witness also by them you know yeah and it would make sense that having multiple witnesses would have a, you know, a mm-hmm. compound effect over yeah. over having a single yeah a single witness yeah. um yeah and uh, so so there's this potentially you could say there's an aim ultimately to get people 
to express narrative and tell st- mm-hmm. and this is typically would be with stories about about their trauma is is that is that where you're heading for with be, um, but then i always qualify that w- with this because i'll often get this question in training sessions do people have to tell the story of what happened with words in order to heal i don't think so because i've now i've seen over decades survivors uh, of a, of domestic violence who could not go out there and just tell these stories verbatim. They have told them in other ways, through imagery, through movement, through enactment. So they've used the art to tell the story, but not in an explicit way because they're fearful, you know, of retaliation still. And they've, you know, they've reported, and I believe them, that they have you know, reached a place where you know, they're able to function and feel whole again, even after the most horrific things have happened to them. So I think there's another piece there, but I think for the majority of people, yeah, being able to tell and be witnessed in, in people to hear their words because we are language oriented. Um, right. Being, yeah. That that's a really powerful thing. Yeah, the, and it's that return to the community, whatever that community is, some meaningful yeah. group of people that's they they understand. Yeah, they feel what you, you're expressing. Right, right. Yeah, that, yeah. we um, really need that. Yeah, yeah. I and yeah. and and that makes sense, even if that community is something that's created in the therapeutic context, right? Doesn't, I mm-hmm. guess for, for many people, there won't be a, a community to go back to, right? But they've become mm-hmm. so isolated from their mm-hmm. kind of community yeah. of origin. And I would say that because the working with the teachers right now is um, part of a grant. And uh, so now it's been two and a half years and finding out that actually the thing that's the most powerful it's powerful for them to do the moving, the sounding, the enactment, you know, all this, all these different kinds of expressive approaches. But doing it together is really where the change happens. You know, they, they change somewhat, but they say doing it together. Wow. You know, I feel so connected to myself now, even though I'm con- you know, because I'm connecting with others and we're creating something together. And a lot of it just looks like you know, to if you watch the film, a silly kind of play together and doing movements together that they've created. But it's that connection uh, that really, yeah, really is reparative and helps them see, I guess, you know, a lot of people, we've all lost some connection in this world because of devices. The pandemic didn't help things any. <laughs> so all of that was disrupted. And now to have it back, People really value that, but it also is just a basic human healing factor. But see, I think, again, you could get together. We all get together and talk. But if we do something together, we've really made a more significant bonding there and social engagement, maybe even a memory, because it's a a memory on multi-levels, not just words. Right, yeah. These things you feel in your body, you may never be able to describe it, but just know, like, ha, this is how I feel. You know, remember that. That was wow. That was a great moment. Yeah, it's fascinating. And yeah. when well, we we started this conversation, you're talking about this goes back thousands of years, and it's it's not just the mark making and the the cave yeah. paintings you can look at, but it's the it's the it's the plays that people would have acted out around the fire right. or the singing together or mm-hmm. whatever yeah. it might and, be. You know, even I don't know. This is tangential, but I think it's important. Passive activity of watching. Now, you know, we got. We got taken away from that again during the pandemic. But if we, you and I go to a concert, we go to a theater performance, even to a museum, we start to entrain and synchronize to each other. They've actually measured this and they were doing a lot of that measurement before the pandemic because then they got stopped because everything, you know, got closed down and we got isolated. But that we actually, our bodies and respiration and heartbeats start to entrain to what we're listening to, seeing, experiencing when we're in a group together. So that went on for thousands of years too. There was always an audience for these things as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so just being a passive observer is, is, is in itself reparative. 
But yeah. perhaps are we saying that to be an active participant is has a greater reparative yeah, value? I think it's better, <laughs> but but it's pretty good that you could get this, yeah. you know, some of this from passive, you know, because I think they're doing a lot more studies with uh, older adults, you know, who, you know, just bringing them to things and realizing, wow, it's really changed their body, mind and spirit in that moment of being together and witnessing something. Yeah, engaged together in the senses is powerful. So, yeah. Yeah. And and so as as you as a as a as a practitioner, Kathy, where do you then you know, it must be a fine balance for you in terms of like how much do I want to contribute as an artist in this process versus you know be, being the therapist here, you know, how do you find your your line or you know, how do you navigate that, you know, as you and engage as as you work with people. Well, I, you know, I think when I listen to talk therapists, I I hear such a level of stress that I don't think that those of us in the expressive realm are having. We have mm. it, but <laughs> we have a lot of outlets. I think you know by doing things with people. I I, I say the the minute I started really thinking through like. What, what should really go into a session? How much movement should I bring into these sessions? On average, you know, everybody's different. You know, every person that walks in the door or group. But uh, doing those kinds of active things with people, most times I feel pretty refreshed at the end mm. of the session. You know, I mean, there are some things I'm thinking like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried about this. Is you know, the terrible things that people describe or share. but I don't know, you know, and, and I think back to like a lot of, this would be way back, at some point, a lot of us trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. Then I was stressed a lot. <laughs> I thought it would, it would it, you know, it's just all up in your brain and always trying to get people to improve their thoughts and, uh, you know, a lot of different directives and prompts and, and homework assignments for people. And I just thought, this doesn't feel good, you know. I mean, maybe it's it, and it works. I mean, people, some people claim that that really works for them, but as a therapist, I think it, that's a really rough one not to have this kind of engagement with people. You really feel like you're, I think, you're engaged in ways that you're just you never could be engaged with and talk alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seeing someone's expressive output, and that doesn't matter how simple it is. But the fact that they were able to do that, you know, and share that, there's so much good sensory information going back and forth. And that must, again, must have to do with us being humans, that we need not to ignore that. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. We need to advise artificial intelligence not to take that away from us. <laughs> yeah. Trying to change us as we speak. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Devices have not helped in some ways. Yeah. No, because they, well, yeah, they, they, they very much encourage passive, yeah, you know, passive participation, right? Yeah, well, that's why I think you get the phone never asks you, right? Come on, you know, start. start yes, yeah, so that's why I get excited about this too, because I feel like okay, it's an antidote to some of that. You know, it's a, it's a totally other, and for some people, because they're so involved with devices, is a very novel experience. And novel experiences are just, you know, they can be really good for you, even if you have trauma and, you're, you know, you're under the most incredible stress. Um, I, I, everybody's forgetting that this year, because we have so many things happening in this world right now, there were 50,000 people that died of an earthquake, in an earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Mm -hmm. And over the weeks following that, a couple of us, and I was one of them, spent time working with a thousand psychotherapists that were in that region to give them ideas. So I'm doing it over Zoom, you know, all this stuff. But, you know, they introduced that breath thing that I told you about the sigh. Um, yeah. We introduced a lot of just really simple things. But again, through simple movement to help people self regulate, survivors help them self regulate, and the therapists self regulate. And, you know, all I've heard back from those therapists over and over again, and, and we'll probably do some more work this year because things change. I mean, that's a long-term 
situation of crisis and, and trauma, that how they felt refreshed. <laughs> and they were really afraid of what, you know, they were coming into because it's scary to see people in your own country and see what's happened and see people homeless and loss, incredible loss. But the fact that they're doing it with them, they're, you know, not just giving them a worksheet or teaching, you know, saying, okay, I need for you to exhale twice as long as you've inhaled. <laughs> no, you do it with them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The kind of a revelation for a lot of them, but now they're really into it, you know, and, and um, going home and making the images themselves too, you know, doing it for themselves and being ready to, yeah, more, they say they're more ready to address things because of doing the expressive work themselves. And, and what about, you know, this concern, I think that in the, in the sort of traditional therapy space, that mm -hmm. if I put too much of myself into the session, mm -hmm. that I may project my own, you know, traumas or expectations, you know, I might somehow yeah. sully the water if I put too much of myself into the space. Is, is that yeah, a worry it, with this? It happens, I, you know, I, but I think we've made more of it than we should because, okay, so one thing also learning over many years and, and even right in the beginning, if I was a quiet, non-involved therapist with children, for example, in a domestic violence shelter who had been neglected and often abandoned and had a parent right now, was generally the mother who came to the shelter, who was numb and dissociated because of what happened to her, they needed somebody to respond to them. They needed somebody mm -hmm. who was actively involved. Yeah. So it's not like I'm putting my impressions of what's going on on them, but I'm showing that I'm engaged with them. Right. And that does require being animated and being enthusiastic. And, I'm going to know, express with you, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and giving a lot of reassurance. And I think, yeah, I, I, you know, that all has to do with attachment, positive attachment, and, you know, a lot of other things that people need to repair. If you're a blank screen, I don't know, that, that is, a, you know, maybe this is not the best thing, uh, most accurate remark, but I think I went through some programming, learning, and psychoanalysis, and the fact that nobody responds to you while you're talking to them was very dysregulating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you know, so, you know, maybe that's not true for everyone, but I think that whole thing of like, not giving any feedback at all for someone who's experienced trauma that's scary it's, mm. it's, it's, it's like we're on zoom now we can see each other but i i'm on many zooms where i'm always saying can the people that have the dark screen with the names just turn on the screen i don't even have to see you but at least i see the room or something in that it's that dark screen no response kind of thing yeah. So, yeah, I think all therapists, you have to check in about like who, you know, I have a blind spot here about this because you've had your own life experiences. But to disengage, you know, completely or, or not become engaged and playful with someone in an appropriate way, in a sensitive way, doesn't, it's, it's a disservice to them. They need yeah. to feel that regulation from you to develop their own regulation. And they can't get it from just me just sitting here, you know, <laughs> straight face, <laughs> nodding. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they need something. Yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 fascinating because yeah, my 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 yeah. experience, and whilst it's been very beneficial, as I said, has been of, of much more impassive therapists and and often becoming very dysregulated. It's interesting, you know. I, I would feel quite dysregulated yeah. in the sessions. I think would, yeah. yeah, and feel quite wiped out after the session. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I think that's part of the learning on that end of the, you know, the, the approach is like, okay, but, but you have to be able to self-reflect then like, okay, that moment of not getting an answer, why did that get me so upset and dysregulated? You know, and that's supposed to be your insight. Yeah, exactly. I, I think there's another way to go around the barn you know, you know, and give people some sense of themselves that feels, you know, feels like, okay. Okay, I can make it here. I, I can, I can do this. Yeah, I got a rough road ahead, but I had a moment today. You know, 
and and it, it usually comes from the therapist. It should some kind of response or interaction that feels, yeah, you know, establishes that connection. I understand your humanity. You know. Yeah. You can't just give an eye, you know, straight face on that one. Be something <laughs> that happens, you know. And for those people listening to this who uh, perhaps, you know, don't have access to an expressive arts therapist right now, or, you know, that's not something that they've got access to, but they like the sound of this and they can see how it might potentially help them with their own healing and, and regulation. What, I mean, obviously you've mentioned some of them, but what might be some of the other techniques or practices that people could just try on their own uh, to help with their regulation? Well, that's what I'm working on next. You know, everybody said, you wrote the book, now write the workbook. It's kind of like, yeah. you read the book, they want to see the movie. <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, the, the first thing is, I think you have to find a comfort level with this yourself. So I always say, you know, I think there are trainings just about in every major country now in the world. Of course, in the, the nooks and crannies of the globe, there aren't. but. Um, but just to find out what you're comfortable with, with mark making, journaling, movement. You know, when I say movement, too, there's probably a lot of people that are listening. You maybe do yoga or you go to some kind of gym or you participate in some kind of just fun dance class. You know, not necessarily ballroom, but just go for the, the fun of moving together with people. And I always say to start there and, and see where your comfort level is. Everybody kind of leans into something a little bit more, and that's okay too. Some people just feel comfortable with introducing, you know, uh, mark making. You know, uh, let's let's just, you know, oh, you just express that feeling. You know, it felt so strong. Can you show me on paper what that looks like? You know, just what color? Just you know, grab a mm. color. So I just say really start simple uh, with that. Um, but yeah, as for Techniques I could go into a thousand of them, but that's the workbook, <laughs> and it's not well organized in my head yet about how to yeah. best teach other professionals and entice them to get started in this. But I just always say, you start where you are, um, yeah. with whatever seems attractive to you right now. Some people, yeah. it's going to be playfulness and humor. Also, we haven't really talked about that, you know, because yeah. humor is, is part of the. I think the menu of the arts. And another thing I think to look at is there's it's big in the trauma research or get growing bigger is the whole idea of sensory integration. And sensory integration is uh, how the body responds, uh, you know, normally, but also traumatic stress can impact it. So all that kind of hearing, sound, smell, taste, touch, all that. But it's also, and that interoceptive, the felt sense, mm -hmm. how we feel around our body, what our balance is like, some of those different things. So, you know, I, I often do that kind of sensory work with people, too, before we even get in any of this. I'm going to look on my desk here for my, I've got a, a stone. I just happen to have this one on my desk. Sometimes I have a piece of clay, but I ask people just to move the stone around and do some different kinds of motions with it and sense like, huh, what does it feel like close to your body? What does it feel like farther away? How does something feel if you hold it over your head? All these different kinds of things are just sensory processing things, but it gives people different body awareness. Right. This happens to be a stone that I've got wool around, it's felted. Can't find my Beautiful other looking stone. Beautiful like looking rock. Yeah. Or you can have a piece of clay and I might ask yeah. them, Hey, see what you can do with the idea of push with that piece of clay. What, do, what happens with that? Where do you sense that in your body? So, you know, you don't have to, I think for some therapists, it's easier for them to look at that kind of way of doing things as sensory integration. Because they're thinking now that sensory integration is really necessary to, again, work up to the higher brain. That people's right. sensory integration with trauma got disturbed, you know, by the traumatic event or events in a lot of cases. But, you know, my, my good example of that was uh, during uh, the pandemic, 
I was finally able to get my vaccination, but I have been in isolation, not really anywhere, picking up groceries out in the parking lot, all this kind of thing we did in the U.S. And then, oh, excitement. I got the date for the vaccination. Go to the vaccination hall. It's this huge place with all these wonderful people in there. I'm thinking nurses and helpers and all this doing this thing to, you know, wow, we're having a vaccination already. It's come so soon. I'm so excited. Bang, I have a panic attack (laughs) because all of a sudden I'm in this big space with all these people and all this stuff going on. And I haven't, you know, and all the ideas of the pandemic and all how horrendous and fearful and and scary it all was. I I came out of it, you know, because I wanted that vaccination (laughs) so badly. But it was like, wow, wow, when people are traumatized, yeah, this is what happens. Mm. Their whole sense of being is disrupted. You know, people people think, uh, you know, that, that those things aren't related to trauma, but they are. My whole vestibular was gone wild. It was almost like, yeah, everything that had to do with the pandemic came down on me in that moment. Yeah. So that yeah, was my just, a, you know, and that was like an acute trauma. Imagine what people have had. Chronic trauma and they get in environments. Yeah. You know, different senses trigger them. So that's why I have people do different things with movements like that, with just sitting in the chair, piece of clay. Oh, if you pull, what what does that feel like? Yeah. If, you know, if you release it, what does that feel like? If you have to reach for it. All these things bring up different kinds of sensations. They're very simple things, but they can bring up a lot of interesting memories or yeah, you know, different kinds of things that might have troubled people. Yeah, that really resonates. And you mentioned in the book gentle yoga or trauma sensitive yoga, and I've had mm-hmm. some experience of that. And yeah, it's really helped yeah. me with my, oh, yeah. my journey and and body work and and, and using mm-hmm. rolfing where where you've got the, the yeah. therapist working deep into the fascia and yeah, it's made yeah. a mm-hmm. big difference. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But what I'm also thinking is that there's power in you training therapists with this, but also people doing their own, developing their own self yeah. practice mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. with some of the things you've described would make a lot of sense. Well, um, that's the thing that happens, and and luckily now, a lot of the trainings I get to do are are in the in person. We I still do a lot that are online, but it's nowhere near the same experience with this as being with people to do these things and and uh hear what they come up with and and the majority of them are well they're, they're all kind some kind of facilitator some of them are therapists some of them are coaches some of them are body workers you know and they can bring all of this into their work. well that's immediately you know this is immediately what comes to mind for my work at, you know as a, as a coach yeah. and how can we bring more expression and and i suppose what's interesting is that right now expression is seen as like okay well let's do a you know, let's do an afternoon workshop it's a team building thing let's mm-hmm. do this creative uh you know uh, mm-hmm. maybe it's a drum circle or something mm-hmm. and and people would suddenly get a lot of reparative benefit from that and 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 team bonding and so on but it, it for me what's emerging as the possibility is is weaving this into all of the all of the forms of work we do with people yeah yeah um yeah as a kind of a vector or as, as a as a way of approaching whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think more and more coaches are starting to understand this. We get a lot of people from the coaching, kind of whatever the coaching industry is in the U.S., it varies. Um, you know, there's different kinds of coaches, but. Oh, it's, yeah, it's extremely amorphous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, know. <laughs> I know being in well, it, right? Like, like, yeah, you can kind of. <laughs> Pretty much do anything with anybody else and call yourself a coach. So, um, good. Um, well, fantastic. This has been so good. Is it? Is there anything yeah. that, that you might have expected we touched on and we haven't? Uh, that you um, think is worth no, I was just. I'm just back to that question about anybody who's listening, who's thinking like, "Oh, where the heck do I start with this?" I think the whole thing with regulation is really important, and that's probably where we have the most studies about any kinds of arts-based therapies, that we know that there are just infinite amount of ways people find that these things are regulatory. But I just want to throw this idea out there. 
because I always have to think sometimes, uh, you know, like, okay, where, where should I start with this person? One place I always think about, and I tell this to new professionals who are thinking like, okay, I think I want to put this in my work, but where do I start? When we're, before we're even born, we develop, start to develop three different areas of regulation, which are all related to the expressive work. One is touch, that apparently we start to develop eight weeks in, the, in our mother's womb. We start wow. to develop that. We start to move gradually, and we start to sense rhythm. And that, of course, is listening to the mother's heartbeat. So one of the, the theories that's out there in developmental work is um, if people get a good experience of those, they're called the primary regulatory network. So you have touch, movement, and rhythm, that we got a good start in life. And especially then if we get that from our early ages, like you know, birth to four years old, which when a lot of things get imprinted. But I always think, because you know, many people come in, they're dysregulated. Those are three areas that people can start with. To think about touch, how to bring that in. And not, you know, I'm not talking about touching the person in front of you, only the body workers ever do that, the psychotherapist, that's off limits. But how can we bring <clears throat> the touch in? How can we bring movement in? How can we bring rhythm in? Because those are the three good places to start in this work. So that's one thing. And I always I still think about that. <clears throat> I'll look at somebody, I'll think like, okay, let me think to that because I know they're so overactivated or underactivated. Uh, and not enjoying being in the world. How do I bring those things in through the expressive work? So, but isn't yeah. it fascinating to think that so many therapeutic modalities they don't start anywhere near that. They start no. with sit you down, you don't move, you're not mm -hmm. touching, you know, you're not asked to yes. sort of consciously experience touch, and exactly. you're not asked <laughs> to, to get into any kind of a rhythm, right? Yeah. You, you just start with you know, tell me how you're feeling today, or or well, tell me about your childhood, yeah. right? You're, you're sort of straight <laughs> into up here, but. The, the, yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of the slides I, I show in trainings. I don't know. Sometimes I get a little laughter, but sometimes I think I have stunned the audience of psychiatrists or neuroscientists or whoever. And I say, if we know that getting up and moving, and we do know this from a lot of studies and, and rhythm and touch are so helpful, why are we still sitting across in chairs from each other in the therapy room? <laughs> if we do know these things, and we don't have to move the whole time, but you know, we have to give it some attention you know, in you know, in just gentle ways, and you figure out a way that it works into your session. But why is this still happening? Where you you rush into your you know therapy session, sit down across from the therapist, or sometimes the therapist gives you a choice of where to sit, but you're still going to be you know anchored there for. 50 minutes. <laughs> you know? It doesn't make any sense to me when, when we know all this other stuff about how people feel better. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. That, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Um, I suppose we're reflecting on my own therapies. I mean, the therapists I worked with were wonderful in the end because I did, I did get into my body and I got, you know, mm -hmm. writhing around on the floor and they're, 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 <laughs> they're illiterate. Yeah. Cause, cause when I was doing my sort of heavy birth trauma yeah. work you know yeah. that that was extremely yeah. embodied right and and uh -huh. so on but what comes to mind is was that would there have been a sort of easier on-ramp into that work right because yeah. It, yeah. It, it's it took it seemed like a kind of a lengthy process to get into some yeah. of that deeper work and could there yeah. have been a, a more, in some ways a more efficient yeah. way yeah. I, know, I know people that still go in that direction, but there are other ways now we know that we can, we can ease people in. We don't have to, yeah, put them in that. Yeah. But that yeah. was the early work in, in uh, you know, bio, bioenergetics and, and uh, all these different things that you know, people were realizing the body piece was missing. Just that they were jumping ahead like 10 steps, I think. <laughs> Getting yeah. You, yeah, to do these things that you may they missed the first few steps where we can just introduce this. Yeah, and I wonder. Yeah, it would have been. I just. I mean, who knows? I'm. I'm, I'm purely speculating. But yeah, could it, could that have been a, a a better way into that work? Um, yeah, yeah. As opposed to starting with a talk. You know, talk talking based interaction. We'll find um, out. But it's in, yeah. but that's it's fascinating to me. Yeah. What you said. <laughs> Um, and gives people some clues on where to, okay, so maybe starting with the century. And, and what I find is it's, it's interesting you mentioned about the gym because you can, you can go to the gym and be very um, sort of unconsciously do it, right? You're moving your body, you're grinding away, you're getting mm -hmm. the reps out. But if you're not 
you know, there's, there's almost like a state of consciousness, which mm -hmm. allows you to kind of feel into what you're experiencing whilst you're doing it. That's I think difficult to do in a lot of, a lot of activity, which, which is why I think, and it's interesting you mentioned gentle yoga, because that is an example of a movement practice where you are being invited to, to be, to put your awareness on your body, on the felt yeah. sense you know, within the body, the interceptive as you move and i think that's one of the things that distinguishes uh this, this kind of movement that moves you towards healing versus just sort of any movement yeah yeah no exactly yeah yeah um i've not heard of anybody doing sort of tra trauma sensitive you know yeah, there um, is a whole... weightlifting but maybe it exists yeah. Well, there is somebody out there, and I, I'd have to remember her name. She does some very physically active, trauma-informed work with weightlifting. And, yeah. Okay, so it does yeah. exist. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Everything exists these days. <laughs> and it's, it's yeah. I'm sure a lot of it comes down to what we've been talking about, having the witness, you know, mm -hmm. putting the awareness. Where, yeah, being conscious of where you're putting your awareness is on. Fabulous. Okay. Well, well, Kathy, thank yeah. you so much. This has been brilliant. Uh, I've, I've loved the conversation. Um, yeah, yeah we covered nice the things. waterfront. <laughs> yeah. It feels like we've, we've had a great tour of you. Of, well, I'm sure there's other big part of your work at least. Right? There's, so there's... you're going to tell everybody where to find this. Exactly. So, okay. well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll certainly put a link to the book, um, mm -hmm. in the description of the show when it goes out there. Um, yeah, and where else would you send people who are interested in your in your work, Kathy? Um, first, to, I guess the easiest thing is my website because all the links are there. That's one place. Um, and then, yeah, that and, would be uh, and spell that yeah. out for people, Kathy, just so that for people Sorry. who are just listening. Oh, www.kathymelchiodi.com. Yep. Yeah. And I have something called a link tree, but I don't have the link. <laughs> we'll make sure we get the link. There's the so interview. many links you can have now. <laughs> they have a tree for it. <laughs> and and that's Kathy with a with a C A T H Y and I. Malchiodi. M A L C H I O D I. Yep. Um, dot com. Right. Yep. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, well. Okay. Thanks once again. Been good. Went by fast. It's been great. Yeah. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much.